Hey everybody, I'm Adam Brush, Senior Trainer at the Institute of Human Performance, and welcome to our weekly IHP staff meetings. Um, in our staff meetings, we're always asking Carlos technical questions, uh, fitness-oriented, nutrition information, movement information, and uh, he's always given us a lot of, of quality answers to our questions, and we wanted to share with you some of our in-house questions, and we want to invite you to ask your questions, and feel free to email me, adam at ihpfit.com, and we'll do our best to get your questions answered during our staff meetings. So what we're going to do is I'm going to be the moderator, and Carlos has 90 seconds to answer our questions. Um, I'm kind of call this JC Unplugged, because we really never know what he's going to say. So enjoy, and I'm going to start off with the first question. This actually, Carlos, this question actually is uh, from a couple different trainers, so we'll just answer, uh, ask this one time. Uh, it has to do with the proper implementation of our chops, high to low, horizontal, and low to high, foot positioning, uh, as well as the actual technique. Uh, high to low? Yeah, let's start with the high to low chop. High to low. Foot what's the foot position? Should foot position should be parallel, soft knees, pretty much like you're getting ready. <clears throat> to do a chop or in kind of an athletic position. Soft knees, and then <clears throat> if we're going to do cable chops, the easiest way to do it and not get into trouble is keep the core stiff, what we call the, the short chops, so here to here. So we take one, put a big rectangle, and we go down here. High, right to low left, turn around, do the other side. If you're looking at a 10 o'clock, 2 o'clock, same thing here. 10 o'clock, 2 o'clock, keep it right in there. And if you're looking at low to high, low to high. Low right to high left and turn around. That's the easiest way. We do have some with foot pivots. They get a little bit more complicated depending on what you're trying to accomplish and the physiology of the person. Okay, great. All right, question number two. How do you feel about the increasing trend in personal training and group fitness where the number one goal seems to be causing fatigue rather than more traditional goals like skill development, strength, power, agility? The traditional development of all of these skills and morphological changes requires a progressive approach, periodization. Class or group classes are not known for periodizing their, or, or even progressing their classes. There is where you have the problem. So there's only one thing left, beat everybody's ass. All right, so that's the trend. The way we do it at, at the IHP here, we'll separate it into three or four blocks where we do certain things that are fast for conditioning, then we slow it down with heavier stuff for strength, then pick up the speed, and then finish with metabolic conditioning. That's the way you develop skill and you develop morphology and metabolics uh, in a progressive manner. Okay. How do you determine when an athlete is going to peak for their certain sporting event, fight, etc., without having them overtrain or undertrain? The easiest way to make sure that somebody peaks is do the first thing we talk to do with the programming. If the event is here, you work backwards. Everybody wants to work towards the event. No, that's the way you train, but you program backwards. So if the event is here, you have to make sure that the last phase is what they need. So for example, in a golf, you don't need endurance, so it would be power. In, uh, Olymp uh, in um, uh, strength training, powerlifting, it would be strength. But in wrestling and those types of things, it would be metabolic conditioning or power endurance. You put, and then you work your power here, strength here, and hypertrophy depending on the uh, time that you have. But the easiest way to make sure that you don't overtrain is start with uh, the last phase and work backwards. That's the most important. Working with multiple beats. <coughs> multiple, that's easy as well. Timeline, event, 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 all right? The whole idea when you're periodizing is to start with a base. So let's say that you have uh, six weeks here. Uh, you do a little power endurance, assuming that that's your last phase of three weeks, and then you do another three weeks where you combine conditioning, strength, and power. Once you develop this base, then you can then oscillate here. Let's say that you have seven weeks here. Oscillate your power and power endurance. And keep doing power, power endurance. Should you have a long period here, then you can bring in a new base of conditioning strength, power, power endurance. Otherwise, just oscillate with power, power endurance, and that's the way you keep it. Excellent. All right. This is a nutritional related question. Uh, we all know that creatine is great for muscle gain. What are your thoughts on using creatine for weight loss? Weight loss? Weight loss, um, it would not be my first choice. I would go with beta alanine. 
which has less cell volumizing and still allows you to buffer and get great workouts. If you're looking at fat loss, okay, and don't care about the weight, creatine would be a great option. And combining creatine and beta alanine is also a third option, which is awesome. So I would, have, I would actually challenge how strongly the person feels about weight versus fat. If it's just weight because you're in a weight class sport, then I would go off the creatine, put beta alanine in, and boom. If it's body transformation, you really look good, and that's what you want to do is look good, then creatine is acceptable because it'll help you train, and with a good diet, your fat will melt off and you'll get what you want, which is a sculpted body. Right. We, have a few, we have a couple of seconds left here. What are your thoughts on uh, uh, creatine and, 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 and parents and their teenage children, not that they're, they're the creatine seems to be taboo. And it's still to this day when we have all the research that says that creatine is actually good for you. How do you kind of get through the parents a little bit and say, hey, creatine's okay? The easiest way to educate parents, and I think the most responsible way to educate parents, is not tell them what to do with their kids. All right? So the way I approach uh, a parent is that, is, is to say, look, I'm going to send you the latest literature review from Richard Kreider and a couple of other very, very good articles from the NSCA so you can educate your family and make a family decision. But I'll let you know that my son, Leo, and, and, and my other kids have taken creatine and all, a bunch of young kids are taking creatine and it's perfectly safe. That's what I can tell them. And that way you don't get the pushback. Right, okay. Okay, moving along. Does the anabolic window really work, or is it just a misinterpreted idea or term? Define the anabolic window. Well, I'm going to have to refer to our trainer on that one. The anabolic window. Um, do we have to, after workout, post-workout uh, post nutrition or recovery, do I really have to have my protein shake within those first 30 minutes? Or Absolutely. The post-exercise window, I would say, I like 30 minutes. I, I like it within seconds. But they say it's up to about an hour to two, depending on which research you read. That anabolic window exists because the body is very receptive and ready for anything. They always say that exercise has an insulin-like effect. The harder the exercise, the more it has. What's the insulin-like effect? It opens up your cells ready to accept stuff. Now, on top of that, they add now sugar to a lot of the uh, supplements, whether it's creatine or beta-alanine or even uh, uh, protein because then the sugar will spike insulin and that even opens up the cells even more. So you have this surge of stuff going into the cell at that time. So definitely, I think it's very important. If you don't replace glucose within the first hour after, it can take you 30, uh, 30 hours, 24 hours to replace it. Very important for athletes who are doing two days. That's a good question and good information for sure. Um, I actually never really heard of this, so uh, maybe hopefully you have. The question is, what is your take on cluster sets? And, cluster sets. And how effective are they and when should they be implemented in a training program? Somebody explain to me what a cluster set is, because it may have another name back from the days that... Uh, well, I, I talked to the trainer, um, who was Mark, and he showed me a, a, a diagram. Basically, I think from what I understand is if you, are, if you are going, if your goal is 10 repetitions, you're going to spread those 10 repetitions out over, it could be five sets. And your, 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 um, your variable is your rest. So you're manipulating your rest in between. So for, from what I saw, he's, it, it, the diagram that I saw was, it, say you're gonna take 75%, if your goal is 10 repetitions, you're gonna do 75% of your one RM max, and you're gonna do two sets. And then this will be your rest period here, whatever right. you want it to be. And then 75% to along the line, so you end up doing five sets of this to get to your 10 repetitions. I can tell you that if I am working with only my 75% and I can get 10 RM versus two rest, two rest, I go 10 RM every day of the week, twice on Sunday. Why? What is the objective, especially from a hypertrophy standpoint? The objective from a hypertrophy standpoint is to call, uh, cause cellular disruption. If I'm here, I'm, my body's not even waking up. Then I rest. I don't care if it's 30 seconds or a minute, okay? The only way this makes sense is if I, instead of using 75, if you're comparing, I do 75% for 10 versus I go 87% to two, 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 then we can talk. Then we can talk because you have 
more weight under the same tension, and that would definitely have an impact on strength training. All you're doing is taking the volume and spreading it out over sets, which is strength training. You cut from 12 reps to 5 reps. We have three questions remaining. Explain the difference in multiple leg positions uh, and how these positions affect the single leg bridge. The single leg the, the, bridge. The varying degrees of knee flexion. Straight leg. Got it. <clears throat> well, position. here's, here's the, the bridge. There it is, okay? Here's the floor, all right? <clears throat> Number one, when, when the item is here, whatever it is, you got the longest lever arm. The longest lever arm is going to present the biggest load right in here, so I'm going to get more here. What happens with varying degrees of knee flexion is the position of the hamstring, okay? And if you're going to the toes here, the positioning of the gastroc, which are two muscles that cross the knee joint. Okay, here I got a more lengthened hamstring, which I like because it resembles the lengthening position at foot contact. So I like this, even with a little knee bend, for running. As I get closer to this, this, and this, I get now more blue. Why? Because I take the hamstring out of it, I take the gastroc out of it, and I put all this here. Flip side is my shortened lever arm, less load on the glute, so this is why you need the hip lifts with the bars that are becoming very popular with Brent Contreras, you know? So if you're gonna do this, you need more weight. If you're gonna do this, less weight, especially if you go to the single leg version. Okay. <clears throat> if adequate functional movements are being implemented to acquire functional ranges of motion, then why would it be necessary to incorporate other flexibility modalities such as foam rolling? So, so read it again. So if we're getting if we're getting functional, we're performing functional movements, we're getting functional ranges of motion. Then why are other flexibility modalities necessary? Oh, okay. I would say another <clears throat> real easy. Look, you don't need more flexibility in my, in any muscle that's being fully lengthened and fully contracted, or even fully lengthened and partially contracted. The virtue that it's lengthened under load gives you the flexibility or range of motion. The question becomes then when the static stretching, rolling, and all that comes into play. The muscle only does this if you want to break it down very simple. Okay? Expand, contract, that's a contraction, under load. All right. When it gets hurt, it spasms. The only way to break a spasm is like this, stretching, like this, massaging, or like this, movement, under load or, or progressively load. So, if you can't load the muscle because you just came out of surgery, because you don't have that lifestyle anymore, whatever, stretching and biofoam rolling are great ways to let the muscle relax so you can work it. But if you think that you're going to stretch and biofoam roll it and go home and get function in that new range of motion, you're sadly mistaken. It's the, you use it or you lose it, axiom, come in. Play. Last question. What is the difference between core strength and core stiffness? And what are some examples? <clears throat> I think core stiffness is a condition or a quality, and core strength could be a, an action. So for example, if you can't do a hanging knee tuck, you're missing core strength. But that doesn't mean you have the core stiffness to back, or core stiffness to, to clinch an individual. By the same token, you can have the right timing of core stiffness, which will be able to swing any implement, box or or or, uh, or a pummel with with, a, with an athlete, and yet not have the core strength to be able to do a specific exercise like the V up or the knee tuck. So I would say core stiffness is a condition that needs to be considered to transmit forces, where active core strength is a strength specific to a movement. Sometimes it's related, sometimes not. 